This panel is a panel of U.S. ambassadors to key countries for commerce between the United States and the African continent. What we want to do now is hear their perspectives on their experiences in dealing with African businesses and guidance for those um, who seek to do business on the ground in each one of their respective countries. We have for this panel a fantastic moderator. We have Zane Virgi, who is a former CNN anchor and correspondent and a communications entrepreneur who has worked across the African continent, though she called Kenya home. And she has had an opportunity to meet with many of these sorts of leaders and heads of state and understand the very critical flows that occur between the US and Africa, not only in terms of business, but in terms of important and critical policy issues that define relationships. Zane Virgi, can I, I'm gonna turn this over to your able hands to moderate this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Teresa. Great to be here. Hello and welcome everyone to the fourth and final panel of this virtual summit, Africa's portal to doing business with the United States. So as we say in Swahili, karibuni to all of you, welcome. I'm Zane Virgi and so honored, Teresa and, and the whole team to moderate this panel of five US ambassadors to key countries in Africa for business, investment and trade. We've got Angola, Ghana, Kenya, where I'm from, not that I'm biased at all, uh, Nigeria and South Africa. In this session, we're going to have a great opportunity to hear directly from those who represent the US government on the ground throughout Africa and really try and, and appreciate the nuanced ways in which the US government engages with the business community in these five key markets. Given our current times and the fact that U.S. embassies are closed at this time, it's especially important for us to make connections between the ambassadors and the local business communities. So that's really what this panel is all about. That's, that's what we want to do today. From our earlier calls, by the way, with the ambassadors, uh, they, they really hope that you do take advantage of this conversation and you do reach out to the economic or commercial services uh, offices that are in each of their embassies and consulates and, 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 and make the most we can virtually out of this. If you want to learn any more about the programs discussed today, please write to Prosper Africa. It's the newly created agency of the US government that coordinates across 17 agencies that do business with Africa. So again, their contact details are shown uh, on the screen here and uh, we'll make them available as well after the program. So if you want to connect, connect with any of the embassies who will be speaking now on our panel, their contact information is available at usembassy.gov. Okay, great. So I'd just like to jump in here and start talking to each of the ambassadors that we have here individually. I really want this to be more of a conversation and just, you know, re I really want to get a, a, both a personal sense of what it's like doing business and, and advocating for business in your countries and regions in Africa, as well as some of the success stories that you've had and, and some of the obstacles that you've dealt with and had to overcome. So I would like to start first with Ambassador Nina Marie Feit, who serves in Angola. Thank you so much for being with us. It's, it's a pleasure. I, let me start by asking you first, what is the most exciting part about doing business in Africa for you? Um, well, Zane, thank you, and thanks everybody for being here. Before I get into that, let me just make one quick correction. Our embassies are not closed. We might be working with fewer people physically in the embassy, but we're all still working. And in fact, I think sometimes we feel like we're making or working even longer days because of trying to make the connections. Um, much like many of the people on this call, we're doing a lot of, of Zoom meetings and things. And so, but in general, what is exciting about doing business in Africa, I think, is the fact that, um, on, for example, in Angola, you have an oil industry that's very mature, that's been here for almost 70 years. So it's well developed, it's, it's cutting edge, it is much as it can be, and it has, you know, uh, trained and nurtured a whole generation of Angolans um, uh, to become professionals. At the same time, you have, because um, as other panels have mentioned in earlier uh, programs, we've got such a youthful population in all of Africa. So we've got such creativity and entrepreneurship. And I think for us, 
particularly you know through the embassy programs we this past year in fact some of it was virtual but we did a who wants to be an entrepreneur program where we brought in speakers we helped people develop their business plans helped Angolans develop their business plans and so i think being um on the ground to see that kind of creativity blossom is really exciting that's a, that sounds awesome. Who wants to be an, an entrepreneur? I like that. Uh, give us an idea of, of the success stories you've had. Like, you know, is there one that we, other than that one, that really stands out in your mind uh, and explain why it worked? Um, we've had a couple different um, success stories, but let me tell you about one, which is with an American company that has recently signed an agreement with the government of Angola for the largest solar energy project in sub-Saharan Africa, which is gonna be about 385 megawatts. The amazing part about this um, was that, and we had a, a Power Africa um, technician embedded in the Angolan Ministry of um, Energy and Water. And one of the things that we learned through his working with the Angolans to strengthen the regulations um, was that there was nothing in the books, you know, because, to deal with a private producer selling um, renewable energy to the government. There was all sorts of rules for selling fossil fuel energy, but nothing on renewable energy. And so that was one of the things that we were able, you know, it was identified first as a challenge. It was through our work um, and a lot of discussions that we had with the government, with various sectors, with the company, that we were able to then find another way to make this happen. It, it became a big project that had financing from different countries um, and companies and sourcing and not just American. And so it was a very collaborative project, which is also part of the success, but it required a lot of, um, just a lot of legwork on the embassy's part, just as in my colleagues all do in their embassies, of talking to ministers, talking to technicians, talking to people along the way to identify obstacles and figure out how we could get, um, we can uh, overcome those obstacles. Right. Well, th that's a great example. How, how do you think that African businesses uh, can tap the resources of the US government on the ground uh, you're, you're in Angola and elsewhere more effectively perhaps than we might already be doing? Um, one thing that we use a lot, we have two business chambers here. We have an American Chamber of Commerce in Angola, and we have a U.S. Angola Chamber of Commerce. And we try and partner with these organizations as much as we can to offer programming. So even during this period of COVID, for example, uh, about a month ago, we did a program with Exim Bank to explain how companies can partner with U.S. companies to access um, Exim Bank credit because there's a $4 billion um, credit line with Exim and the Ministry of Finance in Angola. Some of the other things that we've worked on um, are uh, developing um, a, a workshop to uh, teach and explain American standards to Angolan companies. And then I think one of the things um, our group has been really successful in um, the last, in 2019, which was a much more normal year, we had a trade delegation of over 100 Angolan companies, which mm -hmm. we took to the United States. This was around the oil and gas industry. And with that group, we worked with them ahead of time, kind of doing that here is how Americans do business 101. And, you know, it's the stay in touch. Even if you don't have an answer for them, stay in touch because if they don't hear from you, they think you're not interested. And so just trying to um, coach the, the companies through the cultural uh, differences that exist between the two countries and then also doing matchmaking. You know, mm -hmm. we put them in touch with American companies. American companies look to us to help vet Angolan companies and vice versa. Last question, Ambassador, what would you say has been your biggest challenge uh, in the work that you try to do when it comes to uh, US investment in promoting business uh, in Africa? And, and how did you overcome it? And is there an opportunity perhaps in that challenge that we could take away that would be beneficial for both of us? So listen, I got to talk about the elephant in the room. Angola has been known as a country with a lot of corruption. And you have a current president, uh, Jean Lorenzo, who is doing his best to combat corruption. We, as, a, as, as an embassy, as a US government, are also supporting that through training and capacity building. But you know, that's something that companies are 
reluctant. But in, at the same time, things have changed here. Things are starting to, um, you know, he has made considerable strides. And so I think part of our biggest challenge is also educating people, um, explaining the risks, making sure that people have the, a true understanding of what they're coming into when they come here. And then also working with the Angolans to say, hey, look, at these are some of the low hanging fruit that if you can make this business process a little easier, that will make things more um, uh, less risk, uh, risky for American companies coming in. And so it's a work in progress. I don't want to say we've overcome the challenge, but I think we've made a lot of progress. Fair enough. Thank you for your frankness, uh, Ambassador Fight. Uh, let's bring into the conversation Ambassador Stephanie Sullivan uh, from Ghana. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan, I, I have to ask you this first question, which is really important to doing business in, in Ghana and, um, and elsewhere on the continent. Ghanaian jollof or Nigerian jollof? I was hoping you would raise that question. <laughs> Obviously, Ghanaian. <laughs> yeah, you have to politically navigate these waters appropriately before I can get to the next <laughs> question. <laughs> what was your answer? I didn't hear oh, you. Ghanaian. Oh, right. Okay, okay, yeah, we can move on to the next category. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, well, how have you been able to navigate the, the business uh, landscape and just keeping the train moving given COVID? Um, well, I think uh, Ghana has a very developed IT infrastructure and um, a lot of people were very comfortable pivoting to a virtual uh, existence and um, we continued our outreach to the local business community and even the small and medium sized um, entrepreneurs who had been through our Academy for Women Entrepreneur Program um, to help them stay connected and share best practices and um, let them know that as uh, Ambassador Fight pointed out, we are still open for business. We're just not uh, physically there in the way we used to be. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit because I know there have been uh, some pretty good, I think, uh, virtual trade missions, right, that, uh, that you've pursued and uh, pretty successful video conferences bringing different parties together. Just talk a little bit about that. Has that been more effective than a, an actual in-person one, equally as effective, or did you lose something by doing that? Um, well, I think it's a, a mixed bag. Um, fundamentally, the business environment is about relationships. Um, right. And I think people who already had existing relationships in real life uh, found it a bit easier to pivot. But as the whole world got used to dealing um, with Zoom and these other platforms, uh, I think that in-person connection became less important than it used to be. And so that, I think, has enabled things to accelerate in a way. Like Nobody needs to get a visa. Nobody needs to get their yellow fever shot. Uh, you can just um, jump in and have um, a kind of a more effective use of time uh, from either side of the ocean. You mentioned uh, women and girls projects also that uh, you focused on. How much is, is gender on, on, in Ghana and in, in, the, in the entire region a priority uh, for the U.S. government in terms of investing in, in, in women-led businesses or building skills and advocacy work type of stuff. Uh, what, what are you doing in that space? Sure, it's, it's a huge priority. Um, uh, presidential advisor Ivanka Trump launched the Global uh, Women's Development Prosperity Initiative um, about 18 months ago in Abidjan. Um, the AWE program, the Academy for Women Entrepreneurs, is part of that. Um, we've already heard in previous panels how the African Development Foundation is uh, providing facilities for some of these alumni uh, who's, you know, it's about capacity building and helping people. What, what really warms my heart as a former Peace Corps volunteer is the capacity building uh, and helping uh, people, communities, companies, nations reach their full potential. And one of the things that really drives me, particularly about the um, new approach with Prosper Africa is I first came to an African country in 1980 and I don't want to be having the same conversations if I'm still alive in 40 years uh, that we've been having about development. So something has to change and I think the, the focus on the business to business uh, and um, providing the facilities to have some of these small and medium companies get, help them get from good to great. 
Uh, Ambassador Fight mentioned the Exim facility. There's a similar uh, 300 million Exim facility um, agreement between U.S. Exim and Ghana Exim. Uh, and we're looking forward to seeing those companies that will be the beneficiaries uh, selected in a very um, objective and nonpartisan manner um, based on their potential for creating employment. Uh, we've heard about the youth bulge, and, and that's a serious, not just economic issue, um, but a potential security issue. So it's right. a double-edged sword of, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. crisis and opportunity. <laughs> there always is that double-edged sword, depending on how we weight it. Um, so uh, one question here, because um, what has changed is that we have this thing called the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, um, right? So how is the U.S. government, how are you looking at future potential investment on the continent, uh, bearing in mind the context in which we're also beginning to operate within the continent. Uh, I don't know what you mean by the context, if you're talking about COVID or no, no, this no, sorry. larger I'm about trade. trade agreement. Oh, yeah. I think it's great. I mean, I, I think there was some uh, misinformation out there that the US was not enthusiastic about um, the continental free trade area. We're 100% enthusiastic. We want to see this larger trading bloc that will be more attractive to um, US engagement in the business sense. and. Uh, we don't, we want to see those barriers come down, um, you know, but it's a building process and, 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 and you've got the sub-regional economic organizations, right. uh, you've got trucks stuck for days at the border, even within an economic organization. And so there's a lot of work to be done, but we have um, been engaging with the new secretariat that's based in Accra, uh, and we're looking at ways that we can help um, uh, amplify and uh, help Americans understand what the opportunities are there because um, it's really a potential game changer. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Kyle McCarter uh, in Kenya to say a few words here. And, you know, it's my home country, uh, Ambassador McCarter. So let me start by saying Jambo, Habari Ghani. I'm missing having a cold Tusker and Tangawizi <laughs> every evening. <laughs> now that I've got that out of the way, uh, what are the U.S.'s priorities in Kenya when it comes to investment? Well, um, we are all hands on deck with this uh, new free trade agreement. Um, every everyone is focused on this. This was uh, this was an, uh, this was a decision between Presidents Kenyatta and President Trump that this should happen um, and we are doing everything we can to, to make it happen. It's not gonna be easy. Uh, we expect it's gonna take some time, but uh, we, are, we are convinced that uh, we have chosen the, the, the right partner to establish a free trade agreement that can be used as a model for the rest of Africa. And, uh, and people are excited about it. They're really excited about it. I, I was I was at I was at the butcher shop just uh, this weekend, and, and and a guy stops me as he's, you know, he, he's grabbing his sack of uh, uh, meat and says, "You've got to get this done." And I said, "Why?" He said, "Because he said he said you're he said we need rules for the game that right. we can all abide by." And uh, and and what he's talking about is in contrast the brown envelope kind of deals that have been going on for so long uh, across Africa. And, and people are tired of it and, and they want to compete uh, right. on, a, on a level playing field. And so that's why I think that's why people are excited. Uh, they're, they, they uh, I, I, you know, I always say that we want to go from aid to trade and, and that's true in Kenya as well. Yeah, uh, they don't want to be uh, dependent upon for just foreign aid. They want to be self-reliant. And I carry and I carry with me in my notebook uh, this list of twelve billion dollars of investment that uh, that people are looking at, you know, bringing to Kenya, and uh, it encourages them. And so uh, right. we are, like I said, we are. Everyone in our embassy is focused on uh, making this free trade agreement happen. You mentioned uh, the butcher shop and the conversation you had. I'm wondering if it was Gilani's and Gigiri right yeah. next to the embassy. Was it, was it that one? <laughs> no, no, no. We're actually uh, in Valley, but uh, it's in Valley. <laughs> it was but, Valley. Uh, okay, okay. I know right. what you're talking about. 
Okay. Uh, just had to clarify because uh, you know they're friends. Um, I uh, I wanted to ask you where do you see the biggest growth area in Kenya in terms of uh, investment opportunities for for Americans we, and Kenyans to engage. We are focusing on any business sector, any industry that can help uh, the United States be less dependent upon China. Uh, any and, and make and help Kenya be less dependent on China. Now, the, the, the balance of trade is one to one with the United States and Kenya right now. It's just not big enough, but it's 34 to one with China. And so uh, we, we, want, we, want to help, we want to help them out as well. So we are looking at pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, as one. Uh, we've got uh, the uh, largest uh, manufacturer of generics. Uh, that has, uh, is looking at coming here uh, and, and setting up shop. Uh, we, we are looking at a refinery. We're looking at uh, uh, numerous uh, textile manufacturers. And, um, and so it's, um, like I said, anything where there can be a, a, a kind of a win-win-win, a win for both of us, but a win to keep us from, uh, keep both of us from being dependent upon China. I, I also think that uh, tourism, right? It's it's one of our, our, our main staples for, of the economy. And I think that the, the US government and, and investment has really come in quite significantly recently, right? To kind of give tourism in Kenya a shot in the arm. That's right. We, we have been focusing on the conservancies um, and um, the, uh, the conservative says, you, you know, that's about 18% of the economy and it's been hit hard and we, and we are trying to get them back quicker than uh, anyone in, in Africa. So we, we're in a way competing against Tanzania. And so uh, we're trying to get people back as quick as possible. You know, we're very fortunate that COVID has not hit um, most of Africa. We, you know, South Africa has had, had some real challenges, but uh, I'll say in Kenya, we, we've had very few deaths, a fraction of the deaths for, to COVID that we were uh, ex expected to have. And yeah. so we have come out of this a little quicker than anyone thought. And uh, it's, it's, it's made a, a safer environment for tourists. And so uh, we're, we're trying to get them, get that back, that industry back as soon as, as, soon as possible, because it, it's hurt a lot of people. Yeah. But uh, we are investing in the the, uh, the the conservancies, and in uh, in in, in training uh, training people while they wait for people to come back, making them much more valuable to the industry. Ambassador, just one more, uh, please, uh, if you don't if you don't mind here, um, on um, when it when it comes to Kenya and and Kenyan businesses, how can they access the resources? that the, the embassy provides, or the US government provides? What's, what's the one thing that you would point us to? Well, I think, uh, you know, one, one of the things that our embassy has done well is they have developed this deal team uh, structure. And, uh, and, that's, and it's something that uh, other, other embassies have been encouraged to do, but this, uh, we try to use every resource we have, we have at post. Uh, and, and, and no one, uh, no one is excused from being part of the deal. Uh, if it's a, if it's, if it's a snag politically, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to go after it. If it's, uh, if it's, uh, it's capital, uh, you know, our FCS folks are going to, they're going to look for it. And, uh, and everyone is obligated to make these deals work. And so I think that, I think this is where Prosper Africa comes in to, Kind of coordinate all of those resources and uh, make sure that they're working together and, and, and not against one another. And um, and I think uh, just being um, uh, being accessible, being quick to respond. Uh, you know, we, in this world, we've got to be much more nimble. We, yeah, we've we've got to be quick, and we got to be quicker than than the people we're competing against. And so uh, I would say, uh, you know, that Prosper Africa is there for that. And, uh, and I will say that uh, the same list that I carry around is one that's driven by them and followed up by us. And, uh, and, and we're, doing, we're trying our best to bring these across the finish line uh, for you. the prosperity of both the United States and Kenya. Awesome. Asante Sana, Ambassador. 
Uh, we'll come back again, uh, <laughs> Caribou, shortly. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, bring in Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard, uh, Ambassador to Nigeria. Uh, great to have you here, Nigerian or Ghanaian Jollof, please. So, you know, one of the very last in-person events that I went to before all, everything shut down with COVID was Ghanaian National Day. And there was a side-by-side -side taste test of Ghanaian and Nigerian. <laughs> oh, no. And um, I am going to decline to tell you which one I prefer. <laughs> Loud, uh -oh. Raw, what difference you may without validating that inference. <laughs> Bravo, I think she deserves an excellent round of applause for that non-answer answer. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that's funny. Um, Ambassador, uh, in Nigeria, so much is going on right now, but let's just mm -hmm. focus on um, the economic and investment priorities that you have mm -hmm. in Nigeria. What are they? Well, you know, we have such a, a robust uh, uh, economic relationship with Nigeria. This is, you know, one of the giant, the giant economy on the continent. We're um, one of the most significant um, sources of foreign direct investment. Uh, we're among each other's uh, largest trading partners. Two-way trade in, in 2019 was $7.8 billion. Uh, after, uh, Nigeria is the second biggest destination of U.S. goods coming here. We're their top 10 market. Um, so it's just, to, it's just a privilege to be um, here as an observer and a guider and a supporter of what is already an incredibly significant um, relationship. I think um, in, in 2020, you know, the story here, while COVID might be, you know, uh, feeling like it's taking uh, not so many lives in this unbelievably youthful, confident, uh, unbelievably youthful continent, in Nigeria, of course, the story is also the impact that the world economic slowdown has had on the price of oil. Um, and so for a country that is overwhelmingly dependent on oil revenues in its budget, um, it's caused some serious reflection and some, um, you know, some uh, uh, put new impetus behind what has long been a stated goal of both the United States and Nigeria, how to more diversify the economy so you're not so uh, concentrated in that one sector. You know, Nigeria very much wants to uh, uh, add value to the products that it has. It wants to become more uh, food um, self-sufficient. It wants to um, expand agriculture. Um, you know, there's a, or you heard from some of the previous panels, the, the robust digital economy. Um, these are all things that, that we discuss with the government of Nigeria that we seek to support. Um, we are the host for the um, West Africa Trade Hub that looks at ways in which in regional barriers within the, the reach, barriers to regional trade can be eroded um, away. Um, and it's a, a very interesting interesting time about thinking about how Nigeria can restructure itself uh, to be in a really good position uh, to diversify and grow in a, in a more balanced and broad way when we get to the other side of the COVID-inspired uh, economic crisis. And, and because Nigeria is such a, a large market, robust economy, you know, innovation that comes out of Nigeria is amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one, one of the entrepreneurs uh, I was listening to earlier today asked this question and I, I was taking added notes and I want to pose it to you uh, mm -hmm. in Nigeria. What can the U.S. contribute to Africa to make it a digital powerhouse? What, what more mm -hmm. can be done? How, how do you see that role mm -hmm. really developing the digital uh, economy of Africa? Yeah, well, you know, we, uh, the U.S. mission here has really strong ties to both uh, Nigerian and American business communities, and we lay specifically with the American Business Council, which is the local affiliate of the American uh, Business Chamber and the U.S. Nigeria Council. And the former organization actually has sort of sector pillars of which the digital economy is one. So it's a fabulous venue to uh, to talk about um, how the policy decisions get made that, that lead to a nimble and, and fleet of foot um, uh, basis uh, for, for digital uh, um, activity. Uh, you know, we're very strong supporters and we've seen uh, during the, the, the COVID shutdown how uh, digital banking and the digital platforms were, were, so, were so important and were so available. And so it's a really great uh, launching pad. So it's, um, we, we meet together with both these organizations, but also sector by sector. So we can sort of figure out um, where our most uh, prized or, or, or important interventions would be to support uh, both Nigeria and American businesses working in right. that field. Right, and, and, and in terms of intervention, there was another theme that came out is mm -hmm. how, how would the US government help advocate uh, safe policy space for startups in particular, mm -hmm. and particularly in tech? <laughs> Yeah, and you know, and I think it's um, it, it's a it's a really fascinating story about the business climate here um, because I think that uh, there there's there are goals of 
Yes, you want to promote a digital economy. Yes, you want to promote uh, value added in agriculture. Uh, but you needed to, in, 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 in holding those cherished goals, I think sometimes there's a, there's a bit of magical thinking. You know, uh, have you really chosen the right policy to enable the digital sector? Um, do you need to think a little bit more about phasing if you say you want to have um, value added in agriculture or in dairy or in what a widget? <laughs> whatever widget you choose, um, that uh, trying to think about um, how to support that without uh, introducing restrictions that in the short term harm consumers and vulnerable uh, populations, because uh, in the, in a, as you're waiting for some, a particular sector to develop, meanwhile, there's a, often a, an increase in prices. So it's a, the, the business community here is really um, uh, very keen to engage with us and the government of Nigeria to think about how you phase that out so that you are protecting most also vulnerable Nigerians who need to buy rice or dairy products or whatever, and getting to the goal of that adding value and, and, and installing industry here. So it's a, it's a very it's a very interesting conversation. And, and just one more briefly, um, mm -hmm. you know, you're navigating the hashtag and SARS protest stuff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's all going on in Nigeria. Then there's COVID yeah. and then mm -hmm. just general economic impact of everything. Um, yeah. on a huge economy so how how are you how are you handling that like in, and mm -hmm. you know keeping things going while navigating something quite profound that is happening mm -hmm. in Nigeria mm -hmm. yeah yeah I mean it's uh you know I could I've been my phone has been flashing all day with sort of um, the little alerts about protests here and there, although of course you know the decision has been taken to to disband the the unit in in question um, but it's a uh, it's it's a it's a time to be a, a great accompanier as a as a partner. Um, uh, certainly on the you know starting at the health front, um, uh, you know we we've always been a big contributor to health in Nigeria, and the the COVID response of this country basically rests on the billions of dollars that we've built in things like lab infrastructure um, over the years, and something like five dozen people who work in my mission are working every day all day on um, COVID nineteen response, um, and so it's identifying opportunities. It's it's remembering to be in this. For the long haul and to to be in it for how we are positioning ourselves for the after the COVID crisis that you're in a good spot given all of the dynamics uh, of uncertainty that we're facing. Thank you Ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, bring Ambassador Lana J. Marks uh, to the stage, South African Ambassador. Uh, great to have you here with us. How's it? Uh, Ambassador, uh, South Africa has taken a beating as the, the country on the continent uh, when it comes to COVID. Um, it's been a really tough uh, scenario to navigate for so many people. Um, from your perspective, uh, how, how, how has that impacted the work that uh, the embassy, uh, the US government is doing, needs to do in, in the largest economy on the continent after Nigeria? Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for that terrific question. And yes, how's it indeed? I've <laughs> <Lekka, really, lekka. laughs> been totally out outnumbered with all you northerners and all your items. <laughs> so thank you for saying something that I'm familiar with. Um, fortunately, South Africa has the largest PEPFAR program in the world. And so we have an incredible infrastructure. It's a, it's a multi-billion dollar program, a $7.4 billion program. Uh, Congress has been very generous to uh, assist South Africa with epidemic control. And because of this infrastructure on the ground, we were able to pivot this entire very significant infrastructure together with the Ministry of Health, Minister McKenzie, who's absolutely phenomenal, to COVID-19. Obviously, um, it has been a challenge for South Africa because they locked down completely. So yeah. it was uh, a challenge for the economy. I feel also blessed to be ambassador here during the time of President Ramaphosa, who's, who's just been absolutely extraordinary. We were also fortunate to supply uh, through this administration 1,000 state-of-the-art, highest technology ventilators to South Africa, even some with the fantastic screens. And this was enormously appreciated by, um, by South Africa. They are via made in Ohio, 100%. And South Africa has never had such a product. So the goodwill engendered because of that has been absolutely extraordinary. We've uh, supplied the oxygen for the ventilators as well. They're portable, so they can be taken into the rural areas. 
Um, and also, it's just a matter, you know, I, I arrived here in November and then had to pivot to COVID with the, the online platforms, et cetera, et cetera. And we've just had to pivot and engage accordingly. So that's amazing. So you got there and, and this happened uh, and you were right in it. Um, so, so in terms of recovery, right? Because as, as, we, as South Africa looks to come out of this, uh, what, uh, what, what, uh, uh, what opportunities uh, does the US government, does your embassy have in place in order to help that recovery? Uh, what, what should South Africans know? Yes. So first of all, when I came here, I saw that uh, South Africa was our 39th trading partner. It's the number one economy on Africa in trade with the United States. And uh, we're number three of South Africa. And number three is not very good for me. Number one is the only language I understand. So I made it my mission from the time I arrived here that I was going to have intense engagement across all sectors. And also there'd been very little engagement with the ministers in South Africa for the last 20 years. I've engaged one-on-one -on -one with all the ministers, with all sectors. And even though we have a COVID year for now, trade, the exports from South Africa to the United States in 2020 have actually, I've done intense engagement. I've been intense about increasing business. And business has increased this year 44% from last year. We're doing a billion dollars a month exports wow. from South Africa to the United States since I've arrived here. And that's just the starting point. What I've done is I've gone to each minister. For example, I met Minister Mantashe, who nobody had met with for years. And I actually, within three weeks, brought him to the United States to our Department of Energy just prior to COVID. And I said, Minister, what can we do for you? What can the US do for you? And I've gone to each and every minister. I've engaged with them extensively and created um, a very good rapport with very, very significant projects both way in the offing coming up now uh, within the coming year, but very significant. Um, South Africa has really pivoted to the United States. The response has been very positive. Right. Um, the agriculture has been way up. The citrus right. has been way up. And I see this just as a starting point for the future. There are many, many projects in the works. And um, I, I think that um, South Africa is availing itself of the United States as we are assisting uh, with South African companies by USAID pivoting, um, helping them to also do business yes. with the United States. I think even if COVID mm -hmm. hadn't happened, this was needed. And, uh, and finally, what would you say are the two or three biggest growth sectors for South Africa when it comes to US investment and business opportunities? Uh, I'd say in South Africa, or even in, in the region, Southern African region. Right, right. You know, I'm not going to limit it to a particular sector. We have tremendous opportunities with agriculture. We have tremendous opportunities in the mineral sector, advanced manufacturing services. So uh, telecom, 5G, we're working intensively on that. I just convened many, many meetings here regarding 5G. Uh, for the future and then actually was in Washington several weeks ago and we, conv we convened a very significant meeting, the NSC, with all the stakeholders for 5G. So tremendous opportunity, defense supplies, there's medical supplies. I could go on and on. I'm not going to limit it to a particular sector or a particular service. It's absolutely across the board and we're only starting. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. All, all ambassadors uh, really enjoyed your responses. Now, I just have a few more minutes left and I got some questions from uh, various people that had come through. In the interest of time, maybe I could just pick one I like. <laughs> uh, sorry uh, if, if I've missed anyone else out because I think it gives everybody the opportunity to answer it rather than just direct one one and then we'll run out of time. And it's also relevant, okay? So uh, the question is this. It is from Kigale uh, in Rwanda, and it's from a finance director in uh, mobile telco sector. And, and uh, the, it's, the question is this, we're talking about international business in a pandemic when travel is difficult, impossible, or prohibited. In what ways 
Have your embassies adapted to a digital environment to establish or maintain connections between the US and your host countries? Now, I know everyone kind of has touched on this, but we can maybe drill down on one or two points that you further want to make or, or highlight. So perhaps I could start with Ambassador Fight. Hi. Um, we have, you know, we've done some really big um, webinars, did one with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in um, Washington, did another one with the BCIU in New York with a number of American companies to let them know what was the situation in Angola, what was continuing to go on. But here, you know, doing, getting in touch with Angolan um, uh, companies, one of the things that we've been doing is we have had uh, webinars here or, or uh, Zoom calls with ministers, with ministries. We've done a lot with um, just kind of the general type of things that we would typically do in a regular period of, of phone calling, of letter writing, um, maybe a little more formal in some regards. And, um, you know, even with COVID, we have found a way to have small meetings, generally outdoors. I think everybody feels a whole lot more comfortable outdoors, wearing our masks and, you know, we can still get together and have a conversation when we need to, because, you know, at the end of the day, the person to person really is very important, but we've got to be safe when we do that. Ambassador Sullivan. Uh, so earlier I mentioned um, we've had a virtual trade mission and we're looking forward to uh, the connections and follow up from that. Um, I, I think the U.S. is very, um, for U.S. business people, I think it actually gives us an advantage vis-a-vis um, -vis the business relationships um, with different African countries because uh, we're already very comfortable with the virtual world and the teleconferences. And, and I just think in a way it accelerates. Um, the, the only thing that's different is it's kind of a longer day because of the time difference, you know, depending on the time of year, four hours, about to go to five hours. Um, but everybody is energized and continuing to um, do what they would be doing anyway. Uh, just in a different way that's, frankly, more time and cost effective. Thank you. Ambassador McCarter? Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're very fortunate because, uh, and, and thanks to Kenya's vibrant uh, digital ecosystem, they, they were able to adjust quick. Uh, for instance, our, our FDA went to a virtual platform very quickly where we set up an operation to where we could, uh, after we had one challenging call, we shifted to a, uh, investing about $200,000 to make sure that we had a way of communicating clearly. I'd say one other big thing that's come out of this too is we have, uh, we're just now launching a way to connect every school in Kenya uh, with, uh, with internet and the K through eight curriculum that is, is actually resident in the school. And, uh, and really that push would not, we would not have, that would not have come about if it wasn't for COVID. And so now uh, every child in Kenya is gonna have an opportunity to learn uh, even through a, another pandemic. So a lot of good things have come from it. Thank you, Ambassador. Ambassador Leonard, what, what are your thoughts? Well, you know, I think uh, where, there, where there's a will, there's a way. I mean, this is the way we have to live our lives. And it, uh, think a little bit about the image in your mind of a stereotypical Nigerian entrepreneur and American entrepreneur. And I think that you would say they are kind, kindred spirits. I mean, they're both sort of known as, you know, aggressively entrepreneurial and energetic and busy. busy. And so those people are going to find a way to come together. Um, and, you know, the very many platforms that our, my colleagues have spoken about, we too have, you know, had... Um, discussions with BCIU, the U.S. Nigeria Business Chamber, the American Business Council, and it's really a fabulous venue for learning about the specific COVID things that we can help fix. Like we had a U.S. Um, hygiene product, uh, products manufacturer who um, was being caught up in the um, the, st the shutdown of state borders early in the uh, in the crisis, and who couldn't get things moved so that you know very important products that, that the population needed to get through this period uh, could be delivered to them. Um, uh, in another case, we had a farmer farm manufacturer um, company that made the point that, you know, if you want to have domestic agriculture and, and production, then probably you need to make it possible for the guy who repairs the tractors to travel across the country in those in those periods. Um, 
so it's uh, it's uh, we're we're looking all the time at the uh, the how we get this information in, how we use it, and and the, as I said, those those connections are uh, like water finding its level. I think uh, to, to 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 go rushing towards each other. Thanks, Ambassador um, Mox. yes, um, <clears throat> I engaged recently with the Minister of Telecommunications here uh, to discuss the needs of South Africa in the digital arena. We then convened with our commercial services folks here, <clears throat> and then with some of our great corporations and institutions in the United States to put this all together and it's going incredibly well. And the second aspect is um, I convened some of our very significant 30 of our largest international corporations uh, like Amazon, GE, et cetera. And we put together a portal. I got USAID to assist with the IT people. And we put together a portal and the presidency of South Africa is very, very excited about it. And we're gonna make this next week actually live. And it's gonna be available to the presidency, all the ministers, all the premiers of all the provinces in South Africa, and it's going to train free all young South Africans in the digital arena and uh, have opportunities for young South Africans with American companies in the digital arena. So these two examples um, I'm really excited about. Thank you so much. I think we have like time for a quick final thought if uh, anyone is bursting to say anything. Um, I kind of like to wrap it up that way and you leave all of us with a concrete thought, like the one thing you want us to, to take away from all of this. Um, Ambassador Fight, uh, if we could just go back around and, and start with you, just short and tight. And what's the concrete thing I need to know as, as an African business, as an Angolan business, uh, wanting some uh, US help and, and building that relationship and investment? Um, we're here to help you. We're committed to helping companies and we're also committed to working with the government of Angola to improve the business environment here. Ambassador Sullivan. Uh, what she said, but also um, <laughs> patience and persistence go a long way. And I think it's important mm -hmm. to uh, take time to examine the cross-cultural differences. Uh, and when you're pitching your company, don't pitch the way you wanna be pitched pitch the way the American companies want to be pitched. And part of that is, what have you done for us lately? Not, um, you know, here's where we were, our friendship, our relationship 20 years ago, 60 years ago. Um, get, try to get inside each other's minds uh, to facilitate that type of um, productive communication. Great, took notes there. Ambassador McCarter. Well, two things. I think uh, those that invest, uh, uh, the quickest can take advantage of a, uh, a, a population of youth that are uh, trained, prepared, ready to go. Uh, they're innovative, they're hardworking, and uh, all they need is some opportunity. Uh, it, and, and to the second thing is uh, make sure to make use, make use of the, the, the talent that we have at our embassy to, uh, to lead you, guide you, put you in the right place, put you with the right people, mm -hmm. and help you. Ambassador Leonard? Yes, I mean, we're absolutely here to help. And, you know, as befits this economic giant and the strong economic ties, we are a uh, a fully articulated um, uh, set of services with both uh, an embassy here at Abuja and actually I'm in Massachusetts, but our embassy is in Abuja. <laughs> and a consulate in Why you had power for so long? <laughs> Um, so, you know, when we have, you know, uh, economic officers in both places, we have a foreign commercial service presence, uh, the Department of Agriculture, uh, USAID that has Power Africa and the West Africa Trade Hub, Feed the Future, uh, the Trade and Development um, Agency is here, as well as we have a new representative from the, uh, from the new US uh, DFC. So, yes, you can look at the, at the pages and figure out where to send a, um, send a message, but if that's all confusing, you can just send something to directlinenigeria at state.gov and we will direct it for you. We're here to help. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and final word, Ambassador Marks. Thanks. This quote from the facade on the Department of Commerce building in DC, and it says, commerce defies every wind, outrides every tempest, and invades every zone. I'd like to keep in mind the aptness of that quote, because if you consider any area of life, not just in South Africa, but perhaps in Africa as a whole, they wouldn't be radically altered and improved by the guarantee of a job, by the ability to provide for oneself and one's loved ones. It's the base of the pyramid from which everything else is built. 
South Africa and Africa is the future with the young population for the United States. Thank you so much. Really appreciate everybody's thoughts and time and insights here. I think it's a really useful conversation. If you don't mind um, my just saying to, to all the ambassadors here, you know, I used to cover the State Department when I was living in DC and I covered Secretary Rice. I uh, traveled with her around the world as part of the press corps. Uh, the most striking thing um, as part of her press corps is that it was all women, <laughs> except for one guy. I think it was some guy, a guy called Matt at the AP. Um, and we called ourselves the Diplo Babes. Uh, and that stuck for many years. Now I see here that we have, uh, in, I have in front of me, um, all women ambassadors, save for Ambassador Makata, <laughs> which almost replicates the Diplo Babes. Um, and so first of all, Ambassador Makata, you're lucky. Uh, and then I don't know what you guys would call yourselves if we were the Diplo Babes. There's got to be some ambassadorial title with ending in babes at the end. Anyway, uh, so thank you so much. Uh, Ambassador Sullivan, I think you wanted to say something and then pressed something else. Uh, chief submission. Uh, you chief ca can call us chief submission. Frankly, Zane, I didn't even notice. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's, it's so different for me because when I was traveling with, with State and, and Condi, it was mo mostly male ambassadors. Um, so so that, uh, that was striking and lovely for me. Um, Here anyway. Roar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And thanks for indulging me with that story. Um, really appreciate this, everyone. I hope to see Ambassador Makata in Nairobi soon, the only place I'll travel uh, in, the, in the coming months. So thank you very much. Let me turn it over now to the summit chair, Teresa Clark, for some closing remarks. Sasante. Well, Zane, first of all, I'd like to thank you for your excellent moderation of this conversation. <laughs> five significant diplomats. Um, I must say to all of you as an American who has spent the last 25 years of her life in, in Africa, much of which was in South Africa, I'm especially proud of the way in which you are representing the United States. And I can see that our diplomatic corps is in excellent hands. And I thank you for, for all that you're doing. I would also be remiss if I didn't take this moment to thank um, one person in particular, and that is Nicole Peacock, who is sitting in the Department of State and Head of Comms. And it is through her that we have met all of you, as well as the Assistant Secretary of State. And um, quite frankly, Nicole was the seed that planted this, this thing that became the virtual summit. I spoke with Nicole many months ago about putting something together that might, um, might involve ambassadors, might involve the Assistant um, Secretary of State and it mushroomed into what became um, this virtual summit today. So thank you, Nicole, for the introduction to your colleagues here and for making this happen. This has been um, just a fantastic opportunity for African businesses to learn about the resources that the U.S. government makes available. We've closed the day with this session, which I think was a perfect place to do so by bringing it home, making it real, moving from policy to talking about the very specific examples that ambassadors in five key African markets have experienced by telling us specifically the ways in which they have engaged with businesses in their local communities and inviting the business communities to engage with them, their economic officers and their commercial service officers. So with that, I will close today's virtual summit and once again, thank this last panel for your very important contribution to this dialogue.